Good morning. Nice to see you today. Would you please stand as we begin our worship time together? Fun place to visit is San Francisco. I actually lived there for one year of my life. Enjoyed going down to Pier 39. Enjoyed the Girardelli chocolate factory. <laughs> Clam chowder and in a sourdough bread bowl. And one captivating island in the bay, Alcatraz. <laughs> visited there once, just visited. It's commonly referred to as The Rock. It is a secure place. You know, my microphone is uh, ringing. God is referred to in the scripture as a rock. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He endures. He is faithful. He doesn't have a day off due to ill health. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. He never makes mistakes, nor does he have shortcomings. He is never late, and nothing slips past him. Obedient acts toward him do not go unnoticed. He is entirely just, even to the smallest detail. He cannot lie and doesn't deal in injustice or compromise. He is our rock, our shelter, our fortress, and our deliverer. The scripture says, who is a rock save our God? And lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Let's worship him this morning as we sing together the solid rock.
Amen? Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come and we worship you because you're an awesome, great God. And standing in your presence this morning, Lord, there's just something about it that makes us humble and makes us want to bow down and makes us want to just say, Lord, we're not even worthy to be here this morning. But you've invited us to come into your presence. And so we come boldly. And we say, Lord, more than anything else, we want to have a relationship with you. We want you to know how much we love you, how much we care about you, because, Lord, we know how much you care about us. That in our pain, in our suffering, in our heartache, Lord, you are there with your strong arms to hold us up. And then in our rejoicing, Lord, in our rejoicing, you love a party. And this morning, Lord, we've come to celebrate our relationship with you. So this morning, I pray, Lord, that today would just be one of those incredible days where we celebrate your goodness in our lives, where we rejoice over what you've done, and we look forward with incredible hope of what you're going to do in our lives. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. We're going to serve communion at this time over by the double doors. If you would like to take communion, you don't have to be a member of our church. As long as you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, we invite you to take communion with us. If you just like to stay right where you are, we're going to sing a couple more songs. Either way, whether you take communion or whether you stay in your seat, either way, God bless you as you continue to worship. I sing praises to your name. sorrows for the joy of the Lord.
Thank you, choir. Appreciate that. Very appropriate. Good morning. I'm Bob Honey, and it's my privilege each Sunday morning just to say welcome to church. Most of you walked in church today with a little spice in your step. I don't know whether it's the weather or whether it's the basketball games, or and then I hear there's a little scrimmage in football this afternoon. Some way, some way you're a little happier today, and we appreciate that. But it's so nice to see you in church today. Many of you passed many churches to get here today, and we appreciate that. And we trust that we can gain your confidence in you coming to worship with us. Thank you for coming today. It's also my prayer to tell you we do our best to be friendly. No one comes to our church unless someone greets you, smiles at you, introduces himself for just a moment. Let's all stand, introduce yourself to those around about you, greet one another. Let's fill these aisles and thank you for coming today. The Lord bless you good. Okay, so who's rooting for the Har uh, Harbaugh's team today? Harbaugh's team? Anybody? Yeah. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about watching the game. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, it'll be a good time tonight. But uh, you know, my name is Evan Carlson, and I just I love being able to just hang out up here for a little bit and say thank you so much for joining us, especially if you're a guest. If you're a member, yeah, okay, all right. But no, I'm joking. I'm glad that you're all here. But if you're a guest with us today, we're so thankful that you join, uh, joined us today and have uh, decided to worship alongside us. Maybe this is the very first time you've ever stepped foot in church, and we're so glad that you've chosen to spend some time with us today. And uh, you know what? A great way to get connected is through our connection uh, center outside. Uh, if you haven't stopped by there, there's a, a just wonderful people out there that want to be able to shake your hand. It's outside in the courtyard, and uh, they would love to be able to meet with you get you connected. So don't leave today without stopping by there and making sure you shake somebody's hand out there. It's just a nice little booth and they can get you plugged right in to beyond just Sunday morning stuff. I mean, there's stuff all throughout the whole week. So we'd encourage you uh, to do that um, this morning. Um, also wanted to uh, make sure that we, as we do every Sunday, pull out our connection card. And if I could have everybody do that, this is our time to do that. Um, looks just like this. And it's inside your bulletin. It says connections right on it. And on one side is a great opportunity to ask the uh, 
church of any questions that you have and any prayer requests that you might have. Um, so just make sure you spend just a little bit of time filling this out. And as the offering plates are being passed around, we just throw that right inside the offering plate. Very simple. Wanted to highlight something, too, in, in the uh, bulletin on your third page. This is something that's really neat. So I just want to make sure you guys all pull out your bulletin and take a look at this right now. It says Revival, and it's coming this coming Sunday. Uh, it starts Sunday, February 10th, and it's going to be a three-day event. So February 10 through 12, and we're going to have uh, Dr. Jim Deal and the Liberty Quartet. Who's enjoyed the Liberty Quartet over the years? Good stuff, right? Well, they're going to be back this coming Sunday. Um, and it'll be uh, three days of time just spending with the Lord in worship and uh, learning from uh, Dr. Jim Deal. So make sure you're not only joining us on Sunday, but also it'll be Monday and Tuesday evening at 6.30. So get that on your calendar. It'll be a, a great time of worship. Okay. All right. Ushers. Can I have my ushers? All right. Come on, guys. And let's, uh, let's pray for the offering this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you, and uh, we thank you so much for this wonderful, beautiful day that you've given us today, Lord. We are so blessed, Lord, to be able to uh, worship you, Lord, to be able to learn uh, through Pastor Craig and learn um, just through your word. And uh, Lord, we just thank you now for this opportunity to give, and uh, Lord, uh, for this opportunity this morning even to be able to give uh, tangible goods, food goods, and so forth to help organizations and people in need here in this community. And Lord, we just uh, thank you so much for it in your name. Amen. It's been a great morning already. Thank you, Larry, for uh, great worship this morning with the choir and uh, the band. And I've noticed there's grits all over the floor up here. Anybody know why? It's because we had a bunch of kids in here and families on Friday night, and they were doing wild, crazy activities. Now, you've got to imagine this, if you would. They're up here doing these great, incredible activities, and between the activities, they're shouting, and I mean shouting, verses talking about our family is going to follow God. We're going to serve God. Can you imagine that? Wouldn't that be cool? 
No one gets excited about that. I don't know sure what your greatest fear is, but I'll tell you what mine is. Uh, it happened, it happened a, uh, a week ago, Saturday night, and uh, I was out shopping at Safeway uh, with my wife, and uh, we'd gotten our stuff, and we were going through our line with our cart, put the stuff on the little black conveyor belt, and I was doing the pay thing with, uh, with a little uh, kiosk thing there. And a young man behind the counter, and we're talking, and all of a sudden there's a lady right behind me, and she wasn't unloading her cart right. Do you know how to unload your cart right? <laughs> you cannot. You're not supposed to push your cart in that little aisle space and then start unloading from behind, because if you do that, if stuff falls off the front, you're not able to get around and get that. So you know what happened, her car's all full and something falls off and I'm standing right there and here's where my greatest fear happened. I reached down as something fell off her car and she couldn't come around and get it and so I said, oh, would you mind if I got that for you? I'm reaching down, as I'm halfway down, I realize this is a bad situation and I'm not gonna get out of it in a good way. And I said, can I help you with that? And I reached down and it was a bag of feminine products. <laughs> <laughs> But I was already committed, so I had to reach down. And I'll never forget, I put that thing up there. And the first thing that I did is I looked at my wife to try to find some sort of support and encouragement. No way. My wife is laughing hysterically right there. In fact, she laughed all the way to the parking lot. She didn't let up until we got to the car. And here's the worst part. I put that up on top of there, and the young kid behind the counter that was doing the checkout stuff looked at me like this. <laughs> I, didn't, I thought about it later. I didn't look at the lady. I just put it down, and I just paid, and I just walked out. And, uh. Let me ask you this morning. What is your greatest fear in your life? Some of you, it's heights. Anybody have heights, fear of heights? few of us. I was uh, standing next to somebody down front here with a 49ers uh, jersey on, and uh, she has jumped out of over 5,000 airplanes with a parachute. Is that a cra- incredible? That's unbelievable. That'll, that'll cure your... Do you have fear of heights at all? No. Okay. <laughs> you know, at different times in my life, I, uh, I answered that question, what's the greatest fear of my life? I answered that in different ways. And at one point in my life, my, uh, my greatest fear was failure. That with a, uh, an incredibly successful dad, that somehow I would just kind of just be a, a total failure. A- at one time in my life, my greatest fear was that I would be poor. Went through another stage of my life where uh, I had the greatest fear was that I'd marry an ugly woman. <laughs> <laughs> Another point in my life, I, I had a. <laughs> Another time in my life, I uh, worried whether I was going to even get married at all. Remember how that just fear was terrible. But today I want you to know the greatest fear I have in my life is simply this. That with all the blessing that, that God has given in my life, somebody asked me this week, they said, How, how's your life going, Craig? And man, my life is so incredibly blessed. God has done so many incredible things. I think about this church and how over the past 12 years, how time after time there's been these miracles that have happened and, and steps of faith and how people have been obedient and I've gone to front row seat and watching God work in people's lives. I gotta tell you, some people go, Pastor, we're so... Well, you, we're just not sure about you. You have such a hard job. No, I don't. I get to see God do miracles in people's lives. When we prayed for people just a few weeks ago around this altar and, and we laid hands on them and we, we anointed them, I want to tell you, I have seen God answer people's lives and those prayer requests that we prayed for. We serve an awesome God. And yet in the midst of all that blessing and having a a wonderful Christian heritage, I I remember when I was growing up, there was this wonderful older lady that would come and and, and she was, her name was Mrs. Alden. She was the saint of the church and and, and, and she would give us those great big hugs and Mrs. Alt was wonderful. The only thing that I kind of had a fear about Mrs. Alt was she had really long whiskers. (laughs) 
And when she kissed you, it would hurt. It would, it would rub against you. It was terrible. <laughs> but Mrs. Alt would say this. She would say, Craig, your Christian heritage is a wonderful, wonderful blessing in your life. And some of you would sit here today and you would go, you know what? I remember my grandmother, my grandfather praying for me, or maybe it was your mom and dad. And you can look back to a Christian heritage that you have and you would go, you know what? That's a tremendous blessing. That is no, no, nothing that we should take for granted. That is a wonderful thing. And for me to stand here today and say, hey, God has blessed my life in this church. And God has blessed my life with, with wonderful Christian grandparents and parents. And, and, and the exciting ministry we have here in context of all the wonderful things that God is doing in my life. And that I been placed into, uh, in light of all that, that somehow, here's my greatest fear, is that somehow I would slowly begin to drift in my life away from God. And then somehow in the midst of all the blessings that God has given me, that I would get my eyes off of the blessing, and I would get my eyes off of God's grace and God's strength, and somehow in, the, in, in, in just the process of going through life, that my focus would become my goals and, and my ministry and my accomplishments, and somehow without even realizing it, I would begin to slowly drift away from a close relationship with God. And my fear is that one day I would wake up, and, and, and my life would be in sin, and I would wake up and my life would be destroyed, and I would wake up and I would be an embarrassment to my family and I would think to myself, how in the world did I get to a place where I was in such blessing and now I'm waking up to a place of such embarrassment? Because you see, as much as I'd like to stand up here and tell you, hey, I I'm never going to have that. Listen to me. There is a potential in my life. I'm not immune from that and there's a potential that that could happen in my life. And just like the rest of you, I, I run into people from, high, from my past, from high school and from college, and, and, and people who used to be so close to God, people who used to walk with God, and, and so excited about the things of God, and I run into them from time to time, and there's just something different about them. Something's changed, and something's, as you talk to them, there's just something missing, and things aren't the same as they used to be. And I ask them about it, and I hear stories like this. Well, you know, we got married, and we got busy doing stuff. We really, we really didn't have time for church and God, and I guess we just kind of just kind of drifted. Or, well, you know, I met this guy, and he wasn't a Christian, or I met this girl, and she wasn't a Christian. I guess we just kind of drifted away from God. Or I started working on Sundays, and some people have to work on Sundays. I, I, I understand that, but, 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 but I had to start working on Sundays, and, 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 and even when I got off that job, I just never went back to church, and I guess I just drifted in my life away from God. My husband and I had some problems and the church didn't come in and help us and we got turned off to church and never got plugged into another church and things just happened and we just kind of drifted. And see, I'd love to stand here and I'd love to tell you this morning that my life is, is somehow insulated to that. Somehow I'm immune from that drifting process that somehow I've so separated myself and I'm so spiritual and so godly that there's no way that could happen. But I, I gotta tell you this morning, I wanna stand up here and I wanna make sure you know and I wanna be the first in line to tell you this, that I'm a candidate for drifting. That my life has the potential to become a good gossip story one of these days. I'm a candidate for that, and not only am I a candidate for that, but each one of you are a candidate for that as well. Last week, we, uh, we had so much fun talking about worry and, uh, and talking about Elijah. Remember, we went back to the Old Testament. First two weeks we, on worry, we talked about the principles that Jesus gave us, and then we went back and looked at an Old Testament story, took those principles and, and applied it to that story. And, and as I was going back to Elijah, it reminded me of a story of a guy that had such an incredible, incredible relationship with, with God, a, a, a man that was so had such a unique relationship with God that... I, as I think of his, I don't even have the potential to have that kind of relationship with God and know God that well. A man who was so in tune with God that it was reported that God, think about this, this is so incredible, that God actually appeared face to face, face time with God, think about that, face to face with God on two occasions. 
A man that was so brilliant that when it came to insight, not only in the spiritual realm, but in other realms as well, he was so brilliant. He was a great builder. He, he, he built uh, uh, two buildings that people came from all over the place to come and see. And he wrote three book, books. And in his time, they were the best on the bestseller list. And ever since they had the bestseller list, they've been on the bestseller list. And, and, and we could go on and on about the accomplishments of, and, and how unique a relationship this guy had with God, so much so that people would come and they would just sit down and they would say, hey, would you just, just talk to us? And, and, and he would talk about the one true God. People didn't even believe in God would come and they were overwhelmed with how in tune he was with God. And yet in an early stage in his life, he made a decision that caused him to begin to drift. And over time, he drifted further and further and further. And at the end of his life, he was an embarrassment to his family. He was an embarrassment to his nation. And in the, in, in the history of his nation, he became the reminder. He became the poster child of what it means to drift away from God. Be careful. Don't be like him. And don't drift. If you have your Bibles... You have a story of his biography, and I want you to turn there with me this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 10. We're going to look at the life of Solomon. And I want to go through his story together today. 1 Kings chapter 10. We're so glad to have our live streaming family with us today. If you have your uh, Bibles, that'd be great to follow along. If not, uh, there's verses that'll go across the bottom. The verses will come up on the screen. First Kings chapter 10, Solomon was born into a family who knew God. In fact, Solomon had this incredible heritage uh, of, of people who would follow God. His dad, King David, was the first good king of Israel, his mother Bathsheba. Solomon knew in, in, in a way that some of us will never know the amazing relationship between obedience to God and the blessings that happen, the good things that happen when we follow and say yes to God. But Solomon had a first row, front row seat in what happens when there's disobedience and the terrible, terrible things that happen in your life when you don't follow God. Because his family, his background was full of situations. Solomon saw, he, he, he saw what happened when people obeyed God, and he saw what happened firsthand when people disobeyed God. Solomon had this unique opportunity because God didn't allow his father David to build the temple. That responsibility fell to, da uh, to Solomon. Listen, this is so incredible. Think about this, to build the temple that the one true God was gonna inhabit and Solomon was in charge of that, and they built this incredible temple. It took years and years and years, and Solomon was there every step of the, of the way. And then listen to this. One day, when everything was all done, he stood there, and Solomon watched the glory of God, think about this, fill the holy of holies. The Bible tells us that that time was so incredibly special that the man who was there to minister, the men who was there to minister, they had to flee because, catch this, the glory of God was so great. They couldn't handle it. And Solomon, he was there. He saw that. And on two occasions, God appeared to Solomon. One time, God appeared to Solomon and said, Solomon, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Whatever it is. And Solomon said, I'll tell you what I want. I want wisdom. God said, you've got it. And the Bible says no one has ever lived that was ever wiser than Solomon. Not then, not now, not ever. First Kings chapter 10, verse 1. Here's the story. Listen. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon, and, and, and check this out, and his relationship to the Lord... She came to test him with hard questions. Verse 2, arriving in Jerusalem with a very great caravan with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones. She came to Solomon and she talked to him about all that she had on her mind. Solomon, verse 3, Solomon answered all of her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain. See, he didn't just have wisdom. Have you ever known people that had incredible wisdom, but they couldn't share it? They couldn't tell you what they were talking about? Anybody? He just looked at him. He just went, I have no idea what you're saying. But you knew they were smart. Solomon had such wisdom, and yet he was able to explain it in such a way that people were able, like the queen, was able to go, wow, yeah, I get that. That makes sense to me. I understand that. See, there was nothing too difficult for, for Solomon to understand. Verse 23, just drop down. Chapter 10, verse 23. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. Translated, he was the wealthiest man in the world. Here is a guy who is in total control of his schedule. He lived in an era where there was no wars, there was no famine. If ever there, think about this. If ever there was a guy that could have the perfect opportunity to keep his act together, it was Solomon. 
There were no interruptions. There was nothing he couldn't understand. There was nothing he couldn't figure out. There was nothing he couldn't manipulate. There was nothing he couldn't buy. Verse 24, check this out. Verse 24, the whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear wisdom, the wisdom that God had laid on his heart. People went on vacations, I take it. Just to, Solomon, just talk to us. We just want to hear your wisdom. And yet, here, here's the most amazing thing. The Bible tells us in the next few verses... That here's this man who knew it all, who had it all, the most incredible opportunity of anybody in the world to make his life right with God, that this man's life ended in disaster because at a young age, he began to drift, slowly take it, slowly away from God. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, you can read the rest. Verse 2, they, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods, false gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Verse 3, check this out, you're going you're gonna to be amazed. Don't read ahead. Solomon had 700 wives. You know what's funny is we read that and we just go, Solomon, buddy, come on, get a clue. And look, not only 700 wives, but 300 concubines. I got my calculator, and I began to figure this out one day. And if Solomon had slept six hours a, a, a day, only six, and if he, he devoted half of his waking hours to his wives, that meant that each wife got three hours and 15 minutes a year. That's quality time, isn't it? We're talking about in-depth relationship building. You see, here's what's so funny. We read that in verse 3, 700 wives, and we sit back and we go, come on, buddy, get a clue, Solomon. And we think anybody's going to see that you're headed for trouble, and yet here it is, the wisest, smartest, slickest, richest, most in-control man missed it. And if he can miss it, I can miss it. And if he can miss it, you can miss it. And see, we think we're smart. We think we're so slick. We think, oh, you know, we're going to be so careful. And we're only going to get involved in just a little bit of sin. But hey, it's not going to slip up on us. We're in control here. And we read this story, and you know, it scares us a little bit. Verse 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God, as the heart of his father David had been. Verse 7, drop down just a little bit. This is unbelievable. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the, the detestable god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for, check this out, all, how many wives did he have? Some of you are not sure, 700. Let's say it together. He had 700 wives. He did the same for all, verse 7. He did the same for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. I mean, here's a guy in his younger life. He's building the temple for the God. Later on in his life, he's building altars and temples for all these false gods. 700 other gods, think of it. Verse 9, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. The author's just kind of rubbing it in. Verse 10, although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. Verse 11, so the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude, we're to come back to that. Since this is your attitude and you have not kept my co- covenant, this is God speaking, and you have not kept my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Now imagine this. Here's a man who started off so well. Imagine to... I mean, we're looking at this story, and from our perspective, and certainly from his perspective, it seemed to be just a significant, insignificant wrong decision, no big deal, and yet through the process of time, here's his life that ended in disaster. He was an embarrassment to his family, an embarrassment to his nation, and and, and frankly, that scares me to death, because if it could happen to the wisest, smartest, richest, slickest, most in-control guy that ever lived, then it could happen to me, and it could happen to you. Amen? Amen? Come on, let's not sit here today and think, oh, no, no, I'm too good for that, Craig. I got it all under control. No, no, no. If it could happen to Solomon, he's got everything going for him. If it could happen to him, it could happen to me, and it could happen to you. Amen? Well, this is 
this all raises kind of a really important question. I mean, how does, how does somebody get from where he was, Solomon, to where he ended up? I mean, how do, you get, how do you start off seeing God? How do you go from the place of building the temple for thee, God, being overwhelmed by the glory of God, having all this stuff, people seeking you because you have so much wisdom, so much going on? How do you get from that place to a place where you're worshiping other false gods? Look at your notes, if you would. Here's the process of drifting. Drifting always begins with a thought. Here's the thought. Drifting starts like this. I know I probably shouldn't do this, but I don't see any harm in it. I know this is not the right thing to do, but I I can't really see any harm in doing this one small bad decision here. You see, I know what God's word says about this, but come on, I... God's word, Solomon, to say, don't marry foreign wives. But, but hey, hey, hold on. I, I, I'm not going to worship their gods or anything. I, I'm not going to go off the deep end. All I want is one foreign wife, and I'm going to marry Pharaoh's daughter, and, and that's going to kind of solidify our kingdoms, and they're not going to attack us, and we're going to have peace. It's a good decision. And I know what God's word says, but, but come on. I'm in control. I'll be all right. It's just one small wrong decision. So, uh, Solomon marries Pharaoh's daughter. Now, you know what's great is we know from First Chronicles that it wasn't that Solomon didn't know that what he was doing was wrong. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he knew that it was going against what God wanted him to do. And so he does this little trick with God. It's a trick that we do sometimes. Solomon says, okay, God, I, I know I shouldn't marry this woman, and she's living in the city of David. That's kind of really bad. And so he thinks to himself, okay, I can't have her living in the city of David, the holy city, so I, I, I got an idea. I'll build her her own city. That's good. Yeah, God will be happy with that. And there's this tension. He knew what he, wasn't, what he was doing was wrong, and yet he begins to play this game with God, this game that says, I know this is not right, but if I do enough good over here then, you know, maybe God will kind of overlook the wrong and he'll look at all the good I'm doing and go, hey, you're fine. But it began with a thought. Drifting starts with a thought. I know what I'm not doing, what I'm doing is wrong, but I don't really see a harm in it. And see, in our lives, here's what it sounds like. I I know I'm supposed to be the spiritual leader of the home. Come on, guys, this is you. But my wife is so much more spiritual. I'll let her do that. Come on, guys. I know I probably shouldn't be going out with this guy. I know this, you know, this person's not a Christian, but we're, we're just going out as friends. Or I know I probably shouldn't, you know, probably not a good idea to spend a lot of time with, alone with my boss, but, but you know, he's so good to me, and, and there's those little gifts he gives, and I know it's probably not a good idea, but nothing's going to happen. It'll be fine. I know I probably shouldn't be watching this kind of stuff on TV, or I know I shouldn't be entertained by this, but it doesn't really affect me. Come on. Did it get really quiet in here? You see, here's what happened. We keep on making these decisions in our life, and we go, I I know God's not really into this, but I don't see any harm in this this insignificant decision. I don't see any consequences, and and, and yet here's the thing. We'll not see the consequences, and yet we've begun the process of drifting that always, if left unchecked, listen to me, this is so important to where I'm going today, always drifting, if left unchecked, it will always lead to the destruction of our lives. You all right? So Solomon marries one foreign wife and he thinks, no big deal. And you say, Craig, come on, here you go again. You're just, you keep on focusing on little things. What's the big deal? The big deal is this. Every one of us is just one decision away from beginning a process that would, if we keep on going down that line, it will eventually ruin our lives. And it begins with this thought, I know it's not the best thing, but I can't see any harm from it. Don't raise your hand, but have you ever said that? And it boils down to this one decision. Here's here's the decision. Craig, are you going to be so serious about your relationship with me that even when you can't see the consequences of that one wrong decision, that you're able to just turn and say, no, I'm not going that way. I'm going to turn around. Are you so serious about that? And so Solomon makes a decision to marry a foreign wife. Nothing happens except as a young man, he begins to drift in his heart away from God. But drifting just doesn't happen with a thought. There's a step two to it. Soon it becomes an attitude. 
that thought, that decision, all of a sudden becomes a way of life. Verse 11, back to verse 11, chapter 11. Since this is your attitude. In other words, Solomon began playing this game with God. This is what he did. He said, God, I know I've got this foreign wife. God, it's okay, isn't it? Anyway, God, I've got these, this one, okay, I've got 700 foreign wives. You're, you're right, God. Anyway, I've got these foreign wives, and I know that's not what you're into, but God, you know, I, I built them their own temple. Isn't that cool? You know, isn't that wonderful? God, look at all the good I'm doing. Quit looking at this one area of bad. God, look at all the good stuff that I'm doing over here. And Solomon begins to play this latitude. Since I can't see anything negative coming from this decision, there must not be anything wrong. And besides, God's not really interested in the, uh, in the specifics of my life. God is only interested. Have you ever heard people say this is so prevalent theology in, in America? God's really only interested in the spiritual bad average of my life. Have you heard that before? As long as I do more good than bad, I'm okay. Have you heard that? That's so wrong. And Solomon moves from a thought to an attitude and begins to rationalize, and all of a sudden we are lulled into thinking, hey, God's not interested in the specifics. God's just interested in, in just the overall picture. God's, he, he's not interested in every detail of every relationship, of every situation, of every environment. God's just interested in my, the big picture of my life. And I'm telling you this morning, if you have that idea, you, you're wrong. And so Solomon has another wedding. And another wedding, and another wedding, and another one. He keeps on marrying these foreign women. And here's the thing, the whole time he knew what he was doing was wrong. And so he thinks, well, I can't have them worship in, in, in the city of David. So he builds them their own temples. And this neat God, look at all the stuff I'm doing over here. And we look at the story and we go, Solomon, come on, buddy, get a clue. It's so obvious that what you're doing, the path that you're on is wrong. But the wisest, smartest, richest, slickest, most in control guy that ever lived missed it. And if he could miss it, I can miss it. And if he can miss it, you can miss it. And so we play this game with God and we make decisions and we get in the habit of trying to distract God off of the particulars of our life and trying to get God off of the negatives in our lives. And we say, but God, look at all the good I've done. And God says, I'm not interested in that good. What I'm really interested in is this one area in your life because this one area of your life, it means that you've started to drift in your life. And even though we don't see any consequences... I know that if the process doesn't go unchecked, if the process doesn't end, it will always, without exception, it will always end. If it's not stopped, that process will end in destruction. Wow. Drifting begins with the thought. Here's the process. Becomes an attitude. And then number three, the last thing. In Solomon's case, in every case, if it's not stopped, it becomes a way of life. So here we go. We see this guy starting off so well in his life, having everything going for him. And then at the end of his life, he's worshiping false gods. And then he has this thought. He says, well, you know, I, 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 to be a good husband, I need to go to church with my wives. Let's, let's see, there's 52 Sabbaths in a year. Do you realize how many times he went to his own church, his own temple? And all of a sudden, we see this guy who has seen God, who has experienced the glory of God, who knows it all, who could buy it all, who's done it all. And now he's accompanying his pagan wives to pagan temples. And when all is said and done, he's completely far away from God. We find him at the end of his life practically, for all practical purposes, a pagan worshiping dead, meaningless idols. You say, Craig, I'm too smart for that. No, you're not. I'm too in control to allow something. No, you're not. Because here's what we forget. Even though God is the most patient, infinite being in the universe, Satan runs a close second. That's true. Satan is extremely patient, and he knows that if it takes him a whole lifetime to get Solomon, hey, he's satisfied with that as long as he gets him in the end. He knows, that, okay, it's just, I just got to push him away from God just a little bit every year. Hey, listen, as long as I can get Craig to just move a little bit away from God every day, a little bit away from God, a little bit more, a little bit more, and year after year, I keep on having him drift away from God 30, 40 years from now, hey, he's far away from God. He never even knew it. And he knows how slow he's got to go to allow you to drift that you hardly even notice. 
And, and he knows how long it takes to, to, to get you to renew your mind to his, the wrong way of thinking. And he knows how long it's gonna take to get your focus off of God and the things of God and what God wants you to do and gets you away from all those good things that God wants to bring into your life. He knows all of that and Satan is extremely, extremely patient and he will not give up of the process of slowly moving us away from the things of God because his goal never changes. His goal with you, with me, with Solomon, everybody, his goal is destruction of our lives. All of us are candidates for that. There's nobody left out. And what's significant about the story to me is this young man, Solomon, was 100% for God. And the Bible says very clearly that when he grew old, his wives caused his heart to turn away from God. And even though it took years and years and years, Satan satisfied with that because he accomplished that goal. You say, Craig, you know what? That's, that story represents my life. And let me tell you, that, that, that's, that's potentially all of us today. Because whether, whether you struggle with just, just the thought of sin or whether you struggle with maybe develop, maybe you started to develop this attitude and you started to play games with God. You know, God, don't look at the particulars. Look at the big picture. I'm doing good in most areas. And you're trying to get God to look at that and off the, off the bad that you're doing. Or maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're going, wow, that used to be such an important book to me. I used to love getting into this, and now I'd never read it anymore. And I used to, you know, every time the doors were open, I loved being there. I was always there. And I used to be so excited about the things of God, but now they just kind of leave me cold. If you're in that situation, it's because somewhere along the way, you made a decision in your life, and you began to drift away from God, and today you're suffering the consequences of that drifting. Listen, you say, Craig, why are we having revival in our church? I'll tell you why we're having revival. Because it's time, if there's that process that started in our lives, it's time to stop the drifting. The verse that we're focusing on is search my heart, O oh God, and see if there's any part of me where I've started to go away from you. And I want this to be a time in our lives where, we, where God, we allow God to speak to our hearts. We put aside stuff that would, would, would block God's voice in our hearts. And we would say, God, speak to us. Tell us if there's anything in our hearts that, that we're kind of going away from you instead of going with you. And if there is, God, our commitment is we are so serious about our relationship with you that we're ready to get back on track today. Amen? Drifting has the potential to end in destruction if we don't stop. And, and, and see, if, if we would have gone to Solomon and said, Solomon, what are the odds that, you know, if, when you're 50 or 60 years of age, that you're going to be worshiping foreign gods? He would have looked at you and he would have said, you're crazy. Solomon, see, when you get old, your heart's going to be turned away from God, and you're going to be worshiping foreign gods, and no, I'm not going to do that. Just like that, I talk to people all the time, and I say, don't you understand that just that little bit of sin in your life that you don't think is any big deal, it's just a small thing, not a big thing, and yet you keep that sin around, you don't deal with it, you don't say, God, I confess it, I'm sorry, I'm ready to get back, you allow that sin to keep on going, and all of a sudden it becomes this attitude in your life, God, don't focus on that, look at all the good I'm doing, and, 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 and all these things that you think are no big deal, don't you realize that they have po po potential, they have the potential to take you down. I had a pastor when I was uh, in college and he would get up and he would say this and as soon as he said I said you're exactly right he would say sin will take you further than you want to go it'll make you pay more than you want to pay and make you stay longer than you want to stay that's truth no I, I, I can handle it it'll, it'll be fine I, 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 I can manage it no you can't some of you, you sit here week after week and you hear me pour my heart out Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and, and, and you know there's something in your life that's not right. There's something where you're going your way and God keeps on saying to you, hey, listen, come on back. Make that right. Craig, that's really good. You're, you're preaching really good, but see, for me, I, I'm too smart, I'm too slick. Craig, I've got it all under control. I don't see the consequences of this, of this sin in my life. It's no big deal. I'm not gonna go that far. I can handle, and just like Solomon, you laugh at God, and you set yourself up for disaster. Listen to me. This story today scares me to death. 
Because if it could happen to the wisest, smartest, slickest, richest, most in control guy that ever lived, it could ha- if it happened to Solomon, it could happen to me. And listen to me, who do you think that you are, that you are so much more in control that if you allow this process to keep on going, that that same thing is not going to happen to you? See, the Christian life, you know what it's like? The Christian life is like being on a boat. We don't have a lot of places to have boats around here, but what I hear from Pastor Eric is that boats are really cool to be on, aren't they? You get on a boat, and here's what I've learned. You get on a boat, and if you're driving a boat, those winds, if it's wind, especially if it's windy out, and the waves, they not, if you see where you're going way out there, the wind and waves knock you off course. Amen? Anybody boat drivers here? You know what driving a boat's like? It's like I know where I'm going. I've got hold of the wheel. And when those waves and the wind constantly beat on me to go one way, driving that boat is like constant course correction. Amen? No one drive a boat around here? Do I not have any Michigan people where all those lakes are up there? See, that's the Christian life. It's those constant course correction. You, you know, you're walking into an environment, maybe in your life tomorrow, that is going to be, it is going to be hostile to your marriage faithfulness. And, and, and maybe there's that thing that where you have to make a course correction. Possibly in your life, you're walking into an environment tomorrow, whether at work or maybe at school, that is going to be hostile to your relationship with God. There's that course correction you need to make. Or maybe you're walking in an environment that's just structured in such a way that it's constantly, constantly pushing you and pushing you and pulling you away from God and causing you to have thoughts that maybe cause you to drift a little bit. And and the Christian life is this constant course correction. And and, and it's the pull of the world on us. And it's us saying, no, I'm not going to go that way. No, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to keep on heading to my Savior, Jesus Christ, and focusing on him. That's my goal. The question, the challenge is this morning, would you be willing to be so serious about your relationship with God that if there's just a one degree, just a small degree of change that you need to make in your life, would you be so serious about your relationship with God that you wouldn't look around and try to find people that are 180 degrees away from God and look at them and say, God, I'm a whole lot better than them. You know what the truth is? You're always going to be able to find people that you're a lot better than. That's nothing tough. So the question this morning is whether you need to make a 180 degree change and totally radically change the direction of your life or maybe it's just a 90 degree change or maybe it's just that two or three degree change. Let me just ask you, what kind of change do you need to make in your life and would you be so serious about it that you would say whether it's a large change or a small change, I am so serious about this that I'm willing to change. For some of you, it's gone from a thought and now it's become this attitude thing in your life and you're playing this game with God and God, look at all the good I'm doing. For some of you, there's this, there was a time in your life where your marriage was so strong and you're sitting here this morning and you can't figure out why your marriage got into the shape. How did it do that? And, and, and it used to be so great and now you just kind of survive each other. It's because you've drifted in your relationship with your, your spouse. And this morning you're saying, hey, I, I want to get back on course. This morning, you need to start that revival process in your life. Maybe you're single, and maybe you bought into the lie the world says that love covers a multitude of sins, and as long as I'm in love, as long as we're in love, then we can do whatever we want. And, and, and now sin is having its way in your life, and you've plagued, you're plagued with guilt, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, man, if my parents knew what I was involved in, if my best friend knew what I was involved in, how in the world did I get to this place? Maybe this morning is, this, is the day that you need to say, you know what, today it stops. Today I'm, I'm stopping that drifting process, and I'm going to do business with God this morning. And you're willing to say today, God, it was just a thought, it was just an attitude, but regardless of what it was, I'm ready to get back on track to where you want me to be. God, I want the Bible to be so exciting to me again. God, I want to have a a vital relationship with you. I want to have great Christian fellowship. Lord, I I, I want to live a life that's close to you, that's in close relationship with you. Hey, I've got great news for you this morning. Jesus Christ came to die on the cross and resurrect to prove that he has power over sin, power over death, and power to help you have a close relationship with God. That's 
truth to some of you this morning. You need that. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask Larry to come and lead us in a song. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And maybe this morning, whether it's just a small, small thing, or maybe it's a large thing in your life, change that you need to make in your life, whatever it is, today is the day you just get so serious with God that you're willing to do that. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here in a powerful way right now. I pray that your Holy Spirit would not only do that work of convicting like you've been doing, Lord, showing us those areas in our life that we need to get back, but Lord, I pray that you would help us in our hearts to have the courage to step out and say, you know what, today it stops. Today that revival process starts in my life. Would you be willing to say today, okay, God, I'm following you. And I don't want anything to get between me and you, God. Would you be willing today to say, God, I, would you give me the courage just to step out and get things right with you? Larry's gonna lead us in a song. And, and during this song, I, I'm gonna ask you just to have the courage. It, it's gonna be really quiet and it's gonna be really short. We're not gonna spend a lot of time here doing this this morning. But if, if God is speaking to your heart this morning, I, I'm gonna ask you to do something. I'm gonna ask you, I, I know the seats are closed and I know it's gonna be very difficult to get out, but would you have the courage to step out and say, you know what, this is so compelling to me. Maybe it's just a small thing in your life, but God, I, I, I wanna get my life right with you. And you'd be willing to step out into the aisle, walk down an aisle, pray to at an altar here and say, God, it stops right now. Might just be a small thing, but I'm so serious about my relationship with you that I want to take care of it right now. If you're willing to do that, Larry is going to begin singing here in just a second. Step out, come and pray. The altar is not a scary place, not a magical place, just a great place for you to talk to God and share your heart with God. What a wonderful, peaceful place just for us to say, God, here's my life. I want to get it right with you. Larry, lead us, would you? Search me, oh God, and know. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I know God is dealing with people right now. Maybe he's dealing with you. Larry's just gonna sing one more time. If God is calling your heart, would you just be so serious about your relationship with God that you would say, okay, God, okay. And he would just step out and come and kneel at this altar and just pray. I invite you to do that right now. Larry, let's sing it again.
I'm going to pray a closing prayer, and then this will be the end of the service. If you need to go, then you can go quietly. That'll be just fine after I pray. Maybe some of you would just want to stay around and just uh, talk to God in your seat, or maybe some of you would like to slip up to the front. Maybe you're in a small group with some of these people up front, and you would just like to surround them with your love and your care and just pray with them and just say, hey, let me just pray with you just real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and your care in our lives. Thank you for calling us back to you and wanting to have a close relationship with us. Heavenly Father, during this season of revival, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open, that we would be listening to you. And I pray for these people around the altar specifically right now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would meet them at their very need, Lord, when they confess that, when they come to you and say, Lord, would you help me with this area of my life? I pray, Lord, I know you will, that you will come and help them and restore that relationship to where it needs to be. Thank you for that. Lord, maybe someone's around this altar praying for somebody else, and what a wonderful thing that is as well. Heavenly Father, if there's people here this morning that sensed you calling them to a closer relationship to deal with an issue in their life, and yet they held back, I pray, Lord, that you would keep on speaking to them, and that maybe sometime this next week, maybe next Sunday, they would come with their hearts prepared to do business with you. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your care in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray these things, and all God's people said,